Thanks for checking out this week's podcast from Center Street Church. We pray it blesses, encourages, and inspires you. Well, good morning to all of you here at Central Campus and also those who are meeting together at one of our regionals in the city and, of course, those of you watching online. We continue in our study of the Sermon on the Mount, and we come now to Matthew chapter 7, where Jesus talks about this matter of judging others. I'm going to invite you to stand with me, if you would, and we're going to read what Jesus had to say about this matter here in Matthew 7. Do not judge, or you too will be judged. For in the same way you judge others, you will be judged. And with the measure you use, it will be measured to you. Why do you look at the speck of sawdust in your brother's eye and pay no attention to the plank in your own eye? How can you say to your brother, let me take the speck out of your eye when all the time there is a plank in your own eye? You hypocrite, first take the plank out of your own eye and then you will see clearly to remove the speck from your brother's eye. So in everything, do to others what you would have them do to you. For this sums up the law and the prophets. Let us pray. Our Heavenly Father, we want to thank you again for your Son. We want to thank you for his teaching here in this sermon. Lord, help us to understand what it is that Jesus meant when he said, do not judge. I ask, Lord, that you would open our minds to your truth, that you would soften our hearts, and then you'd give us the courage to respond in whatever way we sense your spirit leading us. For we pray it in the precious name of Jesus. Amen. You may be seated. Now, before we um, dig into this passage, let me give you the context in which we find it. This passage that we just read is part of Jesus' Sermon on the Mount, and he's describing his kingdom. In chapters 5 and 6, he describes what a Christian or a true citizen of his kingdom looks like, not only on the outside, but also what his heart and his motives look like on the inside. Now, please hear what I'm about to say, because so many people don't get this. In his sermon here, Jesus is not describing a long list of impossible legalistic standards that we must somehow achieve in our own strength in order to please God and to be a good Christian. No, he is describing what the Holy Spirit does in us and through us as we daily surrender our lives to the Lord and cultivate our friendship with him. He is describing how the Holy Spirit transforms us into the image of Jesus Christ as we submit to him and grow closer to him. Please, please understand this and don't miss this important truth. It's about what God does in us and through us, not what we're able to accomplish in our own strength here. Now with that in mind, Here in chapter 7, Jesus essentially says, now listen up. Don't start using this wonderful list of wonderful qualities that that I just gave you in chapters 5 to 6 to compare yourself with others and to start making judgments. Jesus knows us so well. He knows there is within each of us a tendency to compare ourselves with others. In all areas of life, not just in the spiritual dimension. Often it is out of our own insecurity, or it's out of a, a desire to promote ourselves, perhaps, that we compare ourselves with others, which often tempts us to be very critical of others, to, to find fault, to put down, or in the words of Jesus, to judge others. And when we are this way, it not only grieves God, but it is devastating to our relationships in general and especially to relationships in the church. And so Jesus gives us a very clear and direct solution to the problem. 
He says, don't. Do not judge so that you won't be judged. So what did Jesus mean when he said, do not judge? This is an important question because these words are much misunderstood these days. I mean, you've ever heard someone say, you know, who are you to judge me? I mean, didn't Jesus say we're not to judge? It's a phrase that is used a lot these days. Well, let me begin by examining what Jesus was not saying here. Now, first of all, Jesus is not saying here that we are to turn a blind eye to the ungodly decisions that we see in the lives of those that we know and love. He's not asking us to pretend that we don't see injustice or that we don't see ungodly attitudes or behaviors. You know, if I'm a parent of a young teen, let's say, and I see my son repeatedly making unwise choices, in fact, sinful choices that are not only hurting him, but also hurting other people. But I decide I'm not going to do anything about it because I don't want to make any waves. I want to keep the peace in our home. I don't want to get him upset with me and not like me. If that's the conclusion I come to, then really I am more concerned about me and being popular in his mind, that I am about truly caring about him and loving him. The focus is on me. It's not on him and what's best for him. Now, I think we understand that. But so often we fail to apply this to our relationships with those that we know and love in the church. We don't want to make any waves and so we say nothing to a good friend, even though he or she is drifting from God, is making unwise decisions, is setting himself or herself up for great hurt and disappointment. And yet, if we really love and care for someone, we're going to be willing to risk approaching them in a spirit of humility and in a spirit of gentleness and grace. But we are going to approach them about our concern for them and their spiritual well-being. Proverbs 27 verse 6 says, Faithful are the wounds of a friend. In Matthew 18, Jesus says, If your brother or sister sins, go and point out their fault just between the two of you. And in Galatians 6.1, essentially says the same thing, but adds this. When we talk to our friend about the concern that's on our hearts, we're to do so with gentleness. And so when we approach a friend about a concern that we have, it's important that we be discreet and that we be gentle, and we do so with the utmost of humility and respect. But if we really care for our friend, We're not going to pretend that it's all okay. And so when Jesus says here, do not judge, he's not saying pretend that you don't see injustice or that you don't see the wrongs in the lives of those that you love. Secondly, when Jesus says here, do not judge, he is not saying we should have no moral convictions. You know, there's plenty of research around these days that says a significant percentage of the population these days perceive Christians to be judgmental. And this is especially true of the emerging generation, those in their 20s. Now, when Christians come across as self-righteous know-it-alls, when they are condescending in their attitude toward those that don't agree with their perspective, then these accusations are warranted. However, Christians are increasingly being accused of being judgmental and intolerant, not because they have self-righteous and condescending attitudes, but simply because they believe the Bible is God's word. 
simply because they believe that certain things are true and certain things are false and certain things are right and certain things are wrong. You see, only a few decades ago, many people clearly understood that it is possible for me to love and accept you as a creation, a special creation of God, even though I do not agree with your view of God or with your lifestyle and moral choices. But you see, that distinction has increasingly become blurred these days to the place where many people believe that I really don't love you and accept you as a person that God created and as a person that God loves if I don't also accept your beliefs and your morality and your lifestyle as being equally right and true to my own. Now let me be clear. People have the right to believe whatever they want. But that doesn't mean that everyone's views or convictions are equally true or right. I mean, just as an example, and I acknowledge it's an extreme example, but as an example, if you believe the earth is flat, and I believe the earth is round, both of us can't be equally right because they contradict each other. And while you have the right to believe this if you want, that the earth is flat, it baffles me that I would be seen as intolerant because I don't accept your viewpoint as equally valid to mine. Now again, if I communicate my position in an arrogant, condescending way, then that is wrong according to what Jesus is saying here. But when Jesus says here, do not judge, he's not saying, don't have any beliefs or convictions about what's right or wrong or what's good and bad and water down and compromise everything that you believe in avoid to, in order to avoid upsetting certain people because the reality is, regardless of how loving and sensitive and tactful we are, as long as we hold, for example, that there's only one way to God rather than many ways, we will be seen as intolerant. Even though those who claim to be tolerant of all faiths and of all views are intolerant of us and our conviction that there is only one way. Thirdly, Jesus is not saying that we should not be discerning. He's not calling us here to stop making judgments about what is right and wrong and good and evil. You know, the reality is we cannot function in life unless we make judgments. We daily make judgments about how we're going to invest our time and money. Parents are constantly making judgments about how best to raise their children. When we hire or we contract with someone to do a particular service for us, say plumbing or an appliance person or whatever, we are making judgments about their character, their ethics, and also their workmanship. In fact, all through the Bible, we are called to be discerning. Let me give you an example. Look down at verse 6. Jesus says this, Do not give dogs what is sacred, do not throw your pearls to pigs. Now, that verse is very difficult to interpret and to understand, okay? So let's keep that in mind. But what is Jesus saying here? In those days, dogs were not nice little smelling pups with painted nails and rhinestone collars and funny little sweater things that they wear and so forth, you know, basically laying around all day and costing a small fortune. Um, <laughs> no, in those days, apart from the dogs that worked with flocks of sheep, dogs in cities were an ugly bunch of wild dogs that ran around in packs, tore apart anything or anyone that they could. Now, hogs were pretty much what they are today. They enjoyed laying in the mud and eating slop. 
So we've got dogs and hogs. Who do these dogs and hogs represent? Well, most likely Jesus is referring to those people who are so focused on satisfying their lust for pleasure and possessions and power and position and so forth that they have no interest at all in hearing what Jesus has to say, in hearing what the Bible has to say about life, about eternity. In fact, some will actually hate what you represent as a Christian and they will oppose you and they will try to discredit you in the eyes of other people and they'll even try to tear apart what you say and what you believe. And brief, and here's my point. Whatever else Jesus may mean in that particular verse, he is clearly calling us, his followers, to be discerning. He's really saying to us to invest our time wisely, to invest our time in those who are open, who are people of peace, rather than those who have a willful, stubborn unbelief. Look at verse 15. And Jesus says, watch out for false prophets. Again, he's calling us here to exercise discernment and to make judgments. All through the scriptures, we're called to discern, to evaluate, and to make value judgments. And so when Jesus says here, do not judge, he is not saying we're to turn a blind eye to ungodly decisions of people that we know and love. He's not saying that we're not to have any moral convictions. And he's not saying that we're not to discern between truth and falsehood. So what is Jesus saying here? He's saying we're not to have a critical spirit or a critical attitude toward others. Having a critical spirit towards someone can escalate from constantly focusing on someone's shortcomings and it can escalate from there to actually to the point of demonizing a person, seeing them as the enemy, treating them with contempt and disgust, wanting absolutely nothing to do with them. In Paul's day, there were Christians who quarreled over disputable matters, like which day was more sacred for worship and for rest, and whether it was okay to eat meat that had been sacrificed to idols. And apparently, some of the believers were so upset with those who had different convictions on these disputable matters than they did, that they grew to despise them. They treated them with contempt, like they were enemies of the faith. And in Romans 14, verse 10, Paul says, You then, why do you judge your brother or sister? Or why do you treat them with contempt. This is what Jesus is referring to, having a hypercritical spirit toward other people. As in Paul's day, we judge people who do not adhere to the same views that we hold in terms of certain controversial doctrines and certain gray areas where scripture isn't crystal clear. We have a critical spirit toward others when we look at their bad habits, their values and their priorities, their involvement in the church, and we judge on that basis their commitment to God. We're often judgmental of other people's lifestyles, the amount of money that they spend on vacations and on leisure and the luxuries that they possess. We judge people's motives and their backgrounds. We judge people by the way that they dress. We judge people's friends or the company that they keep. We often have critical attitudes toward those who worship differently than we do or who do church differently than we do. We're often critical of the way parents raise their children. I mean, the list is long, probably as diverse as the number of people who are here today. So why do we tend to be judgmental of others? Why do we tend to have a critical spirit toward others? Well, the Bible says the problem essentially is one of pride. 
Philippians 2, 3 says, do nothing out of selfish ambition or vain conceit. Rather, in humility, value others above yourself. Put their interests ahead of your own. You see, it's the desire to be first, the desire to enhance our reputation, the desire is to have others admire us, to be seen as the best in our work, which often provokes us to be judgmental and critical of other people who we perceive to be a threat to us. The Bible says that my words and my attitudes are a reflection of my heart. In Matthew 12, verse 34, Jesus says, For the mouth speaks what the heart is full of. Our words are the overflow of our heart. If the heart is full of envy or pride or anger or insecurity or jealousy, these will surface through our attitudes, our condemnations, and our words. A person may be able to fake it for a while, but when he's under pressure or in those unguarded moments of life, the state of his heart will be revealed in the form of lethal criticism or anger or condemnation of those that they envy or are angry at. In 3 John, we read about a man called Diotrephus, who was a malicious gossiper and who actually tried to discredit people and drive them away from the church fellowship. And in verse 9, the Apostle John says, he did these malicious things because, quote, he loves to be first. See, that's the root of our critical spirit. It's our pride, our need to be first, this deception that we are the center of our universe. Now, Jesus goes on to give us reasons why we should not judge or have a critical spirit. First of all, Jesus says, do not judge or you too will be judged. When I have a critical spirit toward others, I will be judged by God not only in the future someday, but also in the present. In 1 Corinthians chapter 11, verse 28, Paul is talking about our preparation to take the Lord's Supper. And he admonishes us to examine ourselves and to judge ourselves. In other words, to repent and to make things right with God and with one another so that God does not need to judge us or to discipline us. So having a critical spirit toward others is serious business in the eyes of God. But we will also be judged by others. When we're critical toward others, others will be critical toward us. In fact, negative judgmental people tend to attract only other negative judgmental people. Most normal people avoid them. A further reason that Jesus gives here for not judging others is that by doing so, we set the standard of our own judgment. He says in verse 2, For in the same way you judge others, you will be judged. And when the measure you use, and sorry, with the measure you use, it will be measured to you. Now again, this applies in two areas. First, judgmental people will be judged by other people according to the same standard. For example, if you're critical of other people's parenting techniques, expect them to apply the same standard to your parenting techniques with just a little interest thrown in. If you judge other people's driving habits or business practices or ethics, be ready to have a number of eyes watching you for just one little slip-up. This, for example, is one of the challenges that we have as pastors. Because when I teach God's word week after week, I'm holding up God's truth. I'm holding up God's ideals all the time on how we're to live our lives and, 
and what our focus and our values and our priorities and our character should be. And even though it's all based on the scriptures, I'm aware that there are thousands of people in this city and elsewhere who know me and are watching my life and my driving habits and other such things, which keeps me accountable almost everything I do, how I talk to people, how I respond to rude people, how I treat people that cut me off in traffic, how I treat people and greet people, because for all I know, the person I'm talking to on the phone or the waitress who is serving me at the restaurant or the person in front of me at the football game, that irritating person in front of me at the football game, the, 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 the person in the car next to me, they may all be from my church. <laughs> and they are making judgments about whether I practice what I preach. And that's a tough place to be. So you can see, when you're a teacher, when you're talking about God's ideals week after week, you welcome greater scrutiny. The Bible is totally right. You should think twice before you agree to become a teacher or a preacher because you will be judged more strictly. But my point is simply this. The person who's always critical of others, the one who's always telling others and giving advice on how you should live, that person is welcoming greater scrutiny and the judgment of other people. But furthermore, if we judge others, it isn't just that others are going to be critical, more critical of us, but it also means that God will judge us with the same measure that we use. James 2.13 says, Judgment without mercy will be shown to anyone who has not been merciful. Now, I have no idea how God does that, when he does that, and what that judgment looks like. But I believe what Jesus says here to be true. And we must take it serious. Now, a third reason that Jesus gives here for not judging others is that we are incapable of judging others. We cannot do it. Jesus says in verse 4, how can you say to your brother, mm, let me take that speck out of your eye, when all the time there is this plank in your own eye? I love Jesus' sense of humor, don't you? I mean, this is great. He's saying, buddy, you've got this big plank protruding from your eye, and so you're not really in a good position, you know? You know what I mean? to take a little speck out of somebody else's eye. What he's really saying is you are unworthy to judge others. You're unworthy to judge others because you're blind to your own sins and faults. Sometimes the thing that you are most critical of in the life of someone else, have you ever noticed this about yourself? The thing that you're most critical of in the life of someone else is usually the thing that, that you yourself are struggling with the most? You're partial in your judgments. I mean, you accuse other people, but you excuse yourself. I don't gossip. I just share a concern <laughs> or a prayer request. That's always a good one. Well, I have a concern that we need to pray about. I'm not critical. I'm discerning. I'm not negative. I'm realistic. I'm not unreliable. I'm just easygoing and fun-loving. Ever notice this in yourself? When someone else sins, we call it what it is. When we do it, well, we water it down. We find another word. Other people lie and cheat. We simply stretch the truth. Other people steal. We borrow. <laughs> Jesus says, that's why you're unworthy to judge. You've got this big plank in your eye. 
You're blinded by your own selfishness and sin. You're, you maximize other people's failures and minimize your own. And it's that spirit that disqualifies you to judge someone else. And furthermore, when Jesus says you've got a log in your eye, he's saying not only are you unworthy to judge, but you're also unqualified to judge. He's saying you're seeing things from a very limited human perspective. You, you don't know all the facts that surround this situation. You don't know this person's background or their past. You're incapable of knowing what their motives are. And beyond that, you have no idea about their future either in terms of what God may yet want to do in and through this person's life. So you really have no pers a, a complete perspective of the past, the present, or the future. Only God is capable of such knowledge. I love what Paul says in Romans chapter 2, verse 2. He says, now we know that God's judgment against those who do such things is based on truth. He's reminding us that our God is all-powerful, all-knowing, and everywhere present. He is truth. He knows the truth and nothing but the truth about us and about everyone else. His judgments are right and just. You see, the difference between God and us is that we often focus on what a person is, while God focuses on what that person can yet become. We tend to make up our minds about someone. We judge them and we say, yeah, he's a loser or she's hopeless or he's untrustworthy or, or she's lazy. And, and, and we just kind of slam the door shut on that individual. We bolt it and we're done. While our God is the God of the second chance for those who want a second chance. I mean, think about where King David would have ended up if it were not for the God of second chances. Think about where the Apostle Peter would have ended up were it not for the God of second chances. Think about where you would have ended up and where you'd be today were it not for the God of second chances. So stay out of the judging business, says Jesus, and let God be God. And that brings us to the final question. How can we safeguard ourselves from this critical spirit? Well, to begin with, we can safeguard ourselves by refocusing our eyes on him. Well, look at verse 5. Jesus says, if you don't want to be a hypocrite, then first take the plank out of your own eye and then you will see clearly to remove the speck from your brother's eye. Notice that Jesus acknowledges here that there is something in that other person's eye that needs to be removed and that if we really love this person, we will help him remove that speck in their eye. He's not denying that, but he says this, before you attempt to do that, first... Take the plank out of your own eye so that you can see clearly to help your friend in the right way. Now, when Jesus says, take the plank out of your own eye, his concern is that we have nothing that's hindering our vision. It's basically the same thing that he says back, said back in chapter 6, verse 22. These are the words we find there. Remember this, Jesus said, the eye is the lamp of the body. If your eyes are healthy, your whole body will be full of light. And what Jesus is saying in that verse is how you live your life and how you treat other people depends in large part on how clearly you see yourself and your life through God's eyes or from God's eternal perspective rather than from your temporary, limited perspective. And so taking the plank out of our own eye is changing our focus in life from our temporary perspective to God's eternal perspective.
perspective. It is removing ourselves as the king of the universe and giving Christ his rightful place as Lord and king of our lives. It is repenting of our pride, our self-centeredness, and our self-righteousness. And here's the breathtaking part. As we stay focused on him and him alone, and we surrender our lives to Jesus and to Jesus alone, we will no longer be inclined to compete against others or to be one up on others or to be controlling and manipulative because our passionate desire is to please an audience of one, and that is God and God alone. As we stay focused on Him and we live in humble dependence on Him, we won't feel impelled any longer to attack others and put others down and to promote ourselves in order to soothe our feelings of insecurity and inadequacy and our fear of failure and in order to impress others and to be seen as number one in the eyes of others because our eyes are no longer out there. They are on Jesus and Jesus alone. And from Him... We establish our identity and our worth. That's the first safeguard against the critical spirit. It is refocusing our eyes where they should be on Jesus and Jesus alone. The second safeguard against the critical spirit is asking God for his help. Look at verse 7. Jesus says, ask and it will be given to you. Seek and you will find Knock and the door will be opened to you. A lot of times people just pull that verse out all by itself. And yet, what we need to understand is that Jesus wasn't changing the subject here. Oh, and by the way, let's talk about prayer. No. This was not an interruption to what Jesus was saying. Jesus is essentially saying here, you're fallible. You will make mistakes. You won't find victory over a critical spirit all in your own strength. And so he says, ask and keep asking for my strength. He says, seek and keep seeking for my wisdom and for my perspective on life. He says, knock and keep knocking for my help in this. He's saying, you can't accomplish this in your own strength. So let me do in and through you what only I can do through the power of the Holy Spirit. And then finally, a further way we can safeguard ourselves from a critical spirit is to live out the golden rule. Look down at verse 12. I think it's the key verse, or one of the key verses in this chapter. So in everything, in everything, do to others what you would have them do to you. For this sums up the law and the prophets. Now, I want to be clear that Jesus' statement here, Jesus is not giving us the formula to heaven, as some people believe. You know, just keep the golden rule, and that's all you need to worry about, and you'll get to heaven. No. This is not the sum total of the Christian faith, as the way that some people have tried to make it. But it is a profound principle that Jesus gave to govern our attitudes toward others. It applies to Christ's followers, and Jesus asks us to practice practice it in every area of our lives. Not the least of which is our tendency to judge others. Notice the word so. So is another word for therefore. Some translations say therefore. And all of you Bible scholars, you know that whenever you come across the word therefore, you ask, what's it there for? All right? Well, it's there to point us back to the words or the verses that precede the golden rule. In other words, Jesus is saying, so, therefore, in light of everything that I've just said about judging others, If you want a safeguard against a judgmental or a critical spirit, then treat others 
the way that you would want to be treated. And you will no longer have an issue with a judgmental spirit. Daryl Johnson says Jesus' statement here is absolutely brilliant. He tells us to start by looking inward to consult our own interest and ask if I were this person, how would I want to be treated? And then as we act toward that person out of our own interest, we find ourselves delivered from our own interest as we focus on the interests of the other person. So how should I treat this person that I'm threatened by, that I'm tempted to be critical of? Well, Jesus would say, ask yourself, how would you want to be treated by this person? How should I deal with this person who I think is guilty of something, but I don't have any clear-cut evidence, and I've talked to them about it. They claim that they're innocent. Well, Jesus would say, how would you want to be treated if you were being accused of something that you didn't do? Whatever that is, do that. How should I approach this good friend of mine who's drifting in her walk with God? Well, Jesus would say, how would you want her to approach you if you were the one drifting in your walk with God? How should I treat the person in my church who has different convictions than I do on certain disputable matters? I mean, should I see them as the enemy? Should I attack his beliefs and accuse him of being unbiblical and refuse to fellowship with him? Well, Jesus would say, how would you like that person to treat you? Well, how should I think about and treat someone in the Muslim faith? Well, Jesus would say, ask yourself, how would you like someone in the Muslim faith to think about and treat you? Sky Jeff and I tells the true story of a college student in Minneapolis named April. She's a Christian, and one day a mosque in her neighborhood was burned to the ground, the result of an arson attack. The leader of the mosque appealed to the community to help in the cleanup, and April decided to do so. And when others in her Christian group found out that she was helping Muslims do this, they confronted her about it. And they asked her, why would you help them? I mean, don't you realize that they are against us? Don't you realize that they're our enemy? They're the ones that we're actually fighting against? And April responded, I disagree with their beliefs and I disagree with their worship, but they are my neighbors and I have to help them. Jesus calls me to love them. And for that, April was eventually expelled from that Christian group. So the question is, let's bring it right home. Should I help my Hindu neighbor if his basement is flooded? I mean, my goodness, someone might think that I'm consorting with the enemy or that I'm, I'm drifting from my Christian faith because I'm doing that. So should I help my Hindu, you know, with his flooded basement? Well, Jesus would say, would you like your Hindu neighbor to help you if your basement was flooded? Want to know how to treat your children? Ask yourself, how would you want to be treated if you were them? Want to know how to treat your spouse? Ask yourself, how would you like your spouse treating you? Want to know how to treat aging parents? Ask yourself, how would you like to be treated when you are their age? If you want to know how you should speak 
to others. If you want to know how you speak about others when you're with your small group or with your friends, then ask yourself, before you speak, stop for a minute. And say, is what I'm about to say what I would want others to say about me in a similar context? Friends, there is no limit to how we can apply this principle to our lives. Can you imagine how revolutionary this is and how different our lives and our world would be if we lived in humble dependence upon our Lord? If we regularly asked the Lord to do what we can't do and if we did for others what we would want others to do for us? I'll close with this. A number of years ago, I read the true story of a boy named Teddy Stallard, which I think sums up the heart of the message today. And Teddy was an unmotivated unmotivated little boy in school. He was one of those little boys that teachers find difficult to like and easy to judge as the problem child in the class. And Teddy was a source of great frustration for his fifth grade teacher, Miss Thompson, who all day faced his deadpan, unfocused stare. Although she said she loved all of her students, Miss Thompson had to admit that deep down inside, that wasn't true because, you see, she didn't like Teddy. And she even received a certain perverse pleasure in marking his papers up with a red pen and writing big fat F's on his papers. Her view of Teddy was distorted by her judgment of him. But she should have known better. One day, Miss Thompson was going through the students' files and She came to Teddy's file and almost passed it by, but last minute decided that she was going to look at it briefly. And after looking at it, something began to change in her heart. This is what she read. First grade, Teddy shows promise with his work and attitude, but he has a poor home situation. Second grade, Teddy could do better. His mother is seriously ill. He receives little help at home. Third grade. Teddy is a good boy, but he's just too serious. He is a slow learner. His mother died this year. Fourth grade. Teddy is very slow, but he's well behaved. His father shows no interest. At Christmas, Miss Thompson's class all brought her presents in pretty wrappings, and they gathered around to watch her open them. She was surprised when she received a gift from Teddy. It was a crudely wrapped gift in a brown paper bag loosely held together with tape. And when she opened it, Out fell a gaudy rhinestone bracelet with half the stones missing and a bottle of cheap perfume. The other children began to giggle, but Miss Thompson had enough sense to put the bracelet on and apply a little bit of the perfume to her wrist. And then she asked the class, doesn't it smell lovely? When school was over and the other children had left, Teddy lingered behind and came back into the classroom and slowly approached her desk and then softly said, Miss Thompson, you smell just like my mom. And her bracelet just looks so good on you. I'm glad you like my presence. And when he left, Miss Thompson got down on her knees And she asked God to forgive her. She would never be the same again. For that day, she became a new person. She became a new teacher. 
She was no longer a judgmental teacher, but an agent of God seeking to bring healing and hope into the life of her students. The log in her eye was gone. And she had a clear eye to see how she could help her students by the grace of God. Through her efforts, through the extra attention that she gave him, by the end of the school year, Teddy showed dramatic improvement and actually had caught up with the rest of the class. Teddy and his father moved away. And so Miss Thompson did not hear for him hear from him for many years. And then one day she received a note that said, Dear Miss Thompson, I wanted you to be the first to know. I'll be graduating second in my class. Love, Teddy Stallard. Four years later, she received another note. Dear Miss Thompson, university was a challenge, but they just told me that I'm going to be graduating first in my class. I wanted you to be the first to know. Love, Teddy Stallard. A few years later, she received another note. Dear Miss Thompson, as of today, I am Theodore Stallard, M.D., I wanted you to be the first to know. I'm getting married next month, the 27th to be exact, and I would be honored if you would come and sit where my mother would have sat if she were alive. You are the only family I have now. My dad died last year. Love, Teddy Stallard. Ms. Thompson went to that wedding. She deserved to sit where his mother would have sat. She had earned that right. God had removed the log in her eye, had given her clear vision, and through his spirit at work within her, had done something for Teddy that changed his life forever. And all of that happened because one Christian stopped looking for reasons to judge and rather looked for opportunities to encourage, to build up, to bring hope and healing. Because one Christ follower surrendered her life to Jesus and lived out Jesus' words here. So in everything, in everything, in everything, do to others what you would have them do for you. May it be so in each of our lives to the glory of God and for the sake of those who need the Jesus that we know and love. Would you stand with me for closing prayer? After the prayer, if there is anyone, in fact, even right now, that just wants to come up here and spend some time with God, about whatever he's spoken to you about, you make your way up here. You just make your way up here and there'll be people here that'd love to pray with you if you want some to pray with you. Let's pray. Our Heavenly Father, I want to thank you for your son, Jesus, who came, died, and rose again to make it possible for us to be reconciled with you and also with one another. I want to thank you for Jesus word here words here in the Sermon on the Mount the reminder that we are not to judge others that we are not to be critical and condemning of one another even though we are not to turn a blind eye to what is right and what is just and what is true you call us to be agents of your love of your grace and of your healing people who live in humble dependence on your enabling grace each and every day, who regularly ask you to do in us and through us what we can't do and who do for others what we would want others to do for us. I pray that you would show us daily what this means for us, how we might do this, and Lord, that you would empower us by your Holy Spirit to live it out in our lives each and every day. 
for I prayed in the precious name of Jesus. And now may the Lord bless you and keep you. May the Lord make his face to shine upon you and to be gracious to you. The Lord lift up his countenance upon you and give you his precious peace. In the name of God the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Thanks for listening. We hope this message has impacted you. We'd like to challenge you to take it one step further and get connected. For any questions or prayer, please visit our website at cschurch.ca. You can also like us on Facebook or follow us on Twitter.